organizational parlance would be a, a quorum. In Jewish parlance, it would be what's called a minyan. I don't know if you've ever heard that, but it's it's kind of like uh, a certain number of people that you need to have to kind of declare it's an official uh, uh, assemblage in a synagogue or, or, or just a, a gathering of people. I, I forget what number it is, but a minyan. But there is also the biblical scripture which says, wherever two or more are gathered in my name, there and, and I don't know if it, uh, there is love is is the, the the way I heard it once said in a, in a song that's called the wedding song by Paul Stuckey. But um, anyway, we have we have a gathering and we have a candle lit. That means that we have started our gathering. My name is Dean. Dean Stevens would that would be and um, I am called the interim administrator of, of this church and uh, and I auto designate myself the fake minister of this church as well and try to do things to make it look like we're uh, we're a church and 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 let's say for the purposes of this meeting that we are because we have been for 103 years, and uh, that's what we're, we're called officially in our name. Um, some people over the years have said that it'd be good if we renamed ourselves, that we weren't really a church, that we were just a, a gathering of, of leftist retirees or, or whatever. Um, uh, but that's, that's how we start our meeting today. And, um, and we say welcome, and thank you for joining us uh, this morning. Uh, we uh, happy, happy Halloween, I think you might say, or happy Dia de los Muertos, or All Hallows Eve, uh, this time when, uh, when the light turns into dark and we need to rage against the dying of the light by lighting candles and by being together and sharing each other's warmth and each other's spirit and each other's uh, inspiration. Um, with that, I want to tell you that um, there is some guy who, who became very, very famous in the, in the world of pop music um, and who, um, who, uh, who passed away a certain number of years ago and is still uh, uh, very famous in the world of pop music. But that is not the real Michael Jackson because we have in our midst, the real Michael Jackson. He happens to live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And um, he was Amar's roommate in college. And he's a, a musician par excellence extraordinaire. And, um, and we are really excited to welcome him to our our humble Zoom and, um, and get to know him a little bit and hear, hear some of Michael's music. Thank you for joining us, Michael. And will you unmute and, and uh, do us a number and introduce yourself, your, yourself to us? Absolutely. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Michael Jackson, as Dean said. Um, I currently live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Um, I was born in DC and um, I grew up attending People's Congregational United Church of Christ, um, which is in DC. And before I start my piece, I just want to share like two fond memories uh, that I had at People's Congregational Church were giving the sermon at Student Recognition Sunday after I graduated St. John's in 2012. Um, and the other was reciting an opening poem um, to welcome Jesse Jackson as a guest speaker during Black History Month in 2013. So those are just two fond memories I have at the church where I grew up. And I will start by sharing this piece called The Truth. It's uh, an acapella spoken word piece. And it goes like this. You can live in heaven based on what you choose to speak. Exercise patience, change isn't free. Everything you need is here underneath your feet. With your wisdom, you can shape the world that we seek. Sentient, you can turn thoughts into things, rocks into rings, metals to machines. You're the mind of God as a conscious human being. But if you doubt that, it'll cost you your dreams. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. 
Michael Jackson, folks, um, uh, is is with us this morning. Um, and uh, now we do a little bit of churchy stuff. And um, for that, I have assembled a few things here um, as a way of, of uh, telling you about some goings on at the church. Um, the first thing is that uh, as I had a couple weeks ago, I have more t-shirts to share with you. And this one says, this year we thought about love. And I don't know exactly what that reference is. I think it's a film or a theater piece, but it came from the Theater Offensive. Uh, theater Offensive used to be our, our tenant here at Community Church. They are a marvelous organization that um, promotes LGBT theater and, and arts in the city of Boston and beyond. They also have a wonderful youth LGBT theater that um, rehearsed in this very auditorium. I'll show you our auditorium here. Um, for quite a few years, they have, they have recently left us um, for a good reason that they got new digs in a, in a brand new building that's uh, right by Fenway Park. And they will there have their own theater and office space. And um, so uh, they left a vacant two floors of our building, um, which is a five-story building here in Copley Square. Uh, I found these recently because we um, were working on cleaning out that space because we have a new tenant. And I'm really happy to announce uh, about our new tenant, which is called The History Project. And these folks, are a longtime Boston institution that archives and and preserves Boston's LGBT history, and um, they are really wonderful folks. And they just moved in a lot of stuff they brought over the weekend, and they um, they have also presented on on Sundays for us as well. And I'm looking forward to their being a part of our um, not only our Sunday congregation, but that uh, a lot of the archiving chops that they have they they auto designate themselves as nerdy archivists will will uh, uh, radiate up and down because up uh, on the fifth floor, we have the archives of Community Church of Boston, which is 103 years of, of history of this church. They are in, in pretty uh, disorganized state, and we are um, trying to find the bandwidth to really pay the attention that they need to be loved and nurtured and preserved and cared for and learned about the history of this amazing place called Community Church of Boston. And below uh, the history project is our new acquisition, which is uh, an enormous mountain of materials about the Sacco and Vanzetti case, which is part of our DNA as well. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it came from the late Bob Dottilio, who we are going to um, uh, celebrate and, and uh, memorialize in three weeks on a Sunday here. And um, they are being very lovingly curated and archived and organized by uh, an amazing new addition to our community who's named Jerry Kaplan, who is uh, um, archivist and uh, retired from Harvard uh, University Press and is spending just a lot of time here with us and is just a wonderful addition to our team here at Community Church as, as a volunteer. So that's, um, that's why I told you about those shirts. Then there's this shirt, which we have tons of, and we've brought out, it's called, it says Justice Today, and, it, and then it says Coming Soon. <laughs> Um, watch for us, justicetoday.com. And that is a, a um, podcast that some of our members behind bars are trying to get going. Um, and they've sent us a whole bunch of t-shirts. Uh, this was about three years ago. We still have lots of them. If you care to come and, and get a copy for yourself, uh, sort of the Justice Today coming soon. I love that sort of uh, uh, um, uh, contrast in <laughs> in, uh, in in thought, uh, but that's that's the first thing. The T-shirts. Second thing I wanted to do is just give you a, a taste of some of some new acquisitions here. This this one I purchased Palestine: A Four Thousand Year History by Noor Masala, 
we had a, a, an event, uh, two events we've had about uh, Palestine. One is about, was about Hebron uh, a week and a half ago, and one was about Gaza just last Wednesday. Um, to one of the events, we had a, an amazing vendor from Martha's Vineyard who sells nothing but Palestine stuff. Uh, and it was just an incredible array of crafts and olive oil and, and books. And, and her name is Linda Cohen, and she has a shop on Martha's Vineyard that sells nothing but Palestinian products. And we were really honored to have her with us. Um, uh, and um, and she left a couple of things, a, a Palestine travel Palestine old poster from the 40s. Uh, and and a beautiful heart made out of olive olive tree wood, and this book that I purchased for for the church. Next we have uh, a guy we've been trying to get for a long time. His name is John Nichols, and this is the fight for the soul the, of the Democratic Party, and it's it's a um, uh, a biography of uh, Henry Wallace, who spoke uh, three times during the 50s at Community Church. He was a vice president of the United States. Uh, hey, Steve. I'm sorry. <laughs> Vice President of the United States and spoke and also Secretary of Agriculture and spoke here a number of times. I'm still trying to get John Nichols to speak. Um, uh, and in the meantime, I, I purchased his book and, and it's going to be around here. We're looking forward to learning more about Henry Wallace and his un, unfaltering attempt to, to change the narrative of the Democratic Party. Now, this was back in 1948 when he ran against Truman and Dewey, um, but it's it's a message that still rings clear right now. Here's a new one that was 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 a birthday present a couple of months ago. Naturalist by E. O. Wilson. I really tried to get E. O. Wilson to speak here, but he was just too uh, too many years into his life, and he passed away at, at you know in his mid nineties just just recently. And this is a, uh, we have a new new section in our our library. It's graphic novels, and this is a graphic novel about the amazing biologist and scientist uh, E. O. Wilson, originally from Alabama. Uh, but was a, a longtime professor at, at Harvard, a people's, people's scientist who, um, who studied ants and bees and, and, um, and it cried to try to convince humanity to save the planet. Here's one that just came in, Red Green Revolution. This is a new edition of the book by Victor Wallace, who has been around the church quite a bit lately because this that you'll see that uh, the paintings, some of the paintings on the walls, uh, as much as I can turn, there's many paintings all over this auditorium that her, his mother, um, who died in 1981, was a marvelous impressionist, French impressionist. Her name was Dion Esmond, all, uh, that you can translate to Diane Esmond if you like, but um, she uh, was born in 1901 and uh, worked until 1940 in, in France, where Victor was born, and, uh, and then moved to the States for five years, then back to France. Her, her paintings were confiscated by the Nazis, some of them re, regained after the war. And it's all a display right here in the church uh, that's uh, an amazing, amazing display uh, for... Um, for us and all proceeds of sales of these paintings go to our very ambitious construction projects around this building. Um, we also have a couple of books that are from Bob D'Atelio's um, uh, library. He has an amazing uh, um, uh, collection of early 20th century photographers. This one, Paul Strand is one of them, tons of books by him, by Edward Weston, by Ansel Adams and um, Diane Arbus, many other really wonderful photographers. It's, it's really, please come and see these books. Uh, we wanna share them uh, with, with everybody. Wednesdays, we have open house around noon. Um, and finally, this is, this is a book that, um, Ralph Fazanella was a friend of Bob D'Atelio's, and uh, we have a beautiful, huge print that we will soon be uh, framing 
to in anticipation of this um, Bob Dottilio um, event that we're having on November 27th, the Sunday after Thanksgiving. So that's that's a bunch of books that I wanted to share with you. We are uh, we are a mountain of books at Community Church, many of them in the dis disorganized way, but slowly we're making chaos into order with our books. I often read um, uh, uh, one of Eduardo Galeano's um, Book of Days, but I left the Book of Days home. And so, hold on. Hey, Steve. We're in church, okay? Thanks. Sorry about that. We welcome Steve McNeil, who is uh, one of our longest time members, uh, but who was talking in the back and he just got um, yelled at by me. Sorry, Steve. <laughs> um, so instead of Eduardo Galeano, I have a, a two or three different like similar calendar books. This one, I want to uh, just shout out uh, his, his name. His name is Ricardo Levins Morales, and he does amazing work from his graphics and woodcut shop in Chicago. Um, just incredible work for the, the movement. And this is a, a calendar um, for 1920, 2022. And it, on October 29th, I'll tell you what happened. That's yesterday, not today. Um, 21 youth plaintiffs go to court against the US government for violating constitutional rights to a climatic climate system capable of sustaining human life. This case was called Juliana versus United States and it came out of Eugene, Oregon in 2018. A child shall lead them, long live uh, the young who speak truth to power like the likes of, um, uh, what's her name from Sweden? Um, Greta, Greta Thunberg. It also says for October, October art, zombie apocalypse, originally drawn for Halloween 2020 at the height of the coronavirus pandemic, the entire cast of characters from your video meeting is represented here in undead form. Um, which one are you? <laughs> That's zombie apocalypse. Okay, we go to now a very old calendar and we look for November 30th. This is a beautiful bread and roses strike calendar, um, anarchist revolutionary calendar from 1972. I found this in the archives and let's look at November. November 30th. Jonathan Swift born in Dublin in 1667. I don't know much about Jonathan Swift. November 29th, Wendell Phillips born in Boston in 1811. Uh, revolution in Poland in 1831. All of these things for us to uh, look up and find out about. Being hungry to learn and hungry to find out. So uh, there's a couple of things. Here's a new one, progressive. Um, the progressive. Let's find November 21, find out what happened. November 30th, Mark Twain born. 1999, protesters confront the WTO Seattle meeting. Yeah, yeah, I remember that one. Um, November 29th, Sand Creek Massacre of Cheyenne and Arapaho people by the US Army in 1864. It could go on. I have two or three more calendars, but I'll, I'll call it quits for, for that little, little segment and say um, uh, we are just really looking forward to hearing from Amar. But first, um, what we call the uh, musical message, which is a little bit more from the real Michael Jackson. Take it away, Michael. All right. Thank you, Dean. All right. So this first piece that I'm going to do for the music message is also an acapella. And then I'll follow that up with a couple other pieces that will have some musical accompaniment. So this piece is called God Blessed. <clears throat> I could complain but I really wouldn't know what to say. Well, not all the way because I feel pain, but I woke up to see another day, blood pumps in my veins, so I'm making gains. COVID-19 wants to make us estranged. I stay in my lane, that's how I maintain. Faith in myself, faith in the name, 
So I ride out with my mask on like Bane. Swear they want to keep us up in these chains. The concrete gets stained. Black boys get retained. Guess I'm a quadruple threat. I'm the same. Tall, dark, handsome, and I am sane. Made in his image. Guess I passed the test. Arm, leg, leg, arm, head. Yes. What'd you expect? There's no need to stress. I'm God blessed. Okay. This next one is called Musings to Myself. Give me one second. Between my toes lays the land of old. I feel good walking on it. I feel exposed to the sun. No need to run. This is the one that turns me gold, melanin mold. I think my color is orange, but I don't know. It's either that, maybe earth green, I suppose. Cause planet earth is my mother and the sun is my father. So I just know I'm a combination of those. Feeling protected from every weapon I'm told. From up in heaven, these angels lighten my load. I'll never fold, cause I've been watching the lessons my life beholds. I'm hot and cold. While they expire, I'll enter a higher mode. While they retire, I'm climbing up higher roads. No need for wheels, my feet can pedal the globe. I feel good walking in them, thank God for souls. So that was called Musings to Myself. And this last one is called The Test. And this is my most recent piece and by far one of my favorites. Could you turn me up, turn up a little bit, please, Michael? We seem to have lost you a little bit. Could... For sure. The, the music or the, the audio, my vocals as well? Both. Okay. Cool. I'll just try to speak a little louder. Again, this is called the test. Don't be stressed. Do that less. Know you're blessed. That's the test. Take a breath in your chest. Take a rest, don't be pressed. Know your mind, know your body, know your soul. There's nothing to waste. Know your taste, know your space, know your pace. When you're ready, take your place. I woke up early on my born day and I took off work, taking it slowly. Appreciating every moment, letting it soak in me. Giving thanks to the creator that molded me. Thankful that I graduated from a lower me. It's different this time around. Spitting these written since the beginning of time was found. They mentioned their whole existence is risen when I'm around. Listen, chin up when I walk around town. Particular, pure in my perimeter. Truth what I administer. Zeroed in on building on these integers. Fighting for my vision, can't give in the false images cartoonist and instrumentalist and when it comes to words i'm prophetic like the scripture is so if you witness this then just know you've been cleansed i'm drawn from the same source where the spirit is don't be stressed do that less know you're blessed that's the test take a breath in your chest take a rest don't be pressed know your mind know your body know your soul nothing to waste know your taste Know your space, know your pace. When you're ready, take your place. And that's the test. Thanks so much, Michael. Absolutely, thank you. <laughs> that was wonderful. Um, tell us a little bit about Albuquerque and uh, besides being a, a, a poet and an artist, uh, what kind of uh, work or activism do you do in Albuquerque, New Mexico? Okay, so 
um, a little bit about Albuquerque. It's in the Southwest. I'm sure a lot of y'all know that. I love it. I'm from the East Coast. And so moving to the Southwest is awesome because it's a completely different change of scenery. It's um, a great place to be. It's a lot more calming. Um, I love the sunsets here. I love being able to see the mountains. Um, coming from a city where there's buildings everywhere, it's it's a breath of fresh air to just kind of be able to see so far in any direction, um, no matter where you are. Uh, so I love it. I think the sky is probably one of my favorite features of being in the Southwest, from the sunsets, the sunrises, and the amazing stargazing. Um, what I do here, I work at a Roadrunner Food Bank. It's the largest food bank in New Mexico. Um, and my particular job as a regional manager, I manage a lot of the food distribution sites that partner with the food bank. Um, so that causes me to be all over Albuquerque, interacting with nonprofit organizations, churches, schools, um, senior living communities, um, all of these places do food distributions with um, the food bank. So it's really good vocational work and uh, it feels good to give back to the community. All right, Michael. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much. We'll hear one more from Michael after uh, after Amar. Um, let me tell everybody that um, I want to do a little uh, a little segment of joys and concerns, um, just to, for us to think think positive thoughts and and say prayers in your own way for few people who have had some health issues. The, the first one is Seren Mudlier, who is in South Africa, um, uh, mourning the passing of his mother and had his own health complications there. So we remember you, Seren, and think about you. The next is Jean McGuire, who, uh, who presented here uh, numerous times over many years. Jean was uh, the founder of the Metco program which uh, takes uh, buses, kids from a lot of places uh, around the um, more underserved parts of the city of Boston to um, um, overserved places <laughs> out, out in, in the suburbs. And um, she did an amazing, had amazing trajectory of, of civil rights activism life um, in the city of Boston. She was, she was assaulted while walking her dog in Franklin Park and is on a, uh, on a um, journey of, of recovery from, from that. And we think about Eugene McGuire. Um, Tilly Teixeira, um, uh, one of our most senior elders at Community Church, took a fall and is at, at uh, Spalding Rehab. Um, we, we think about you, Tilly, as well, and um, I need to give you a phone call and maybe pay you a visit. Um, uh, we have, uh, Crystal, who is our publications manager, and I have been thinking a lot about doing an oral history from Tilly. Um, the sooner the better, um, because Tilly goes back to the, the f uh, 40s and 50s with Community Church. She was married in at Community Church by the minister, Donald Lothrop, uh, in 1953 or something like that. It's just amazing. And so Tilly, we want to, we want to have you back with us. Uh, um, she lives just about three blocks away. Um, so um, get better soon. And another just uh, joy, which is that Dick Crowley, I don't know if he's um, uh, with us on this Zoom, but is is out of rehab and now is in an independent living place by himself to the, to the point that uh, Dick will be able to get on a train and come to Back Bay Station and attend church and be a volunteer again. Dick was our president for uh, a few years just in, in recent memory. And so Dick, we're thinking about you as well and looking forward to welcoming you here on a Sunday morning or, or on any day you'd like to come in. Um, an amazing long history with Community Church joined in the early 80s. Want to tell you real quickly about what's coming up next Sunday. 
we have a full reading of uh, the poem, The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot on the 100th anniversary of its publication. Um, I don't know The Wasteland, but I sure do know David Goulette, who has been a really important um, part of our program in the, in the past uh, three or four years with what's known as the Poets Theater, which he heads up. Um, and they brought several just marvelous presentations to the Community Church of Boston, a, a, a dramatic uh, reading of Boston abolitionists, another program of all uh, young hip hop artists of color, um, uh, just another program of just five uh, vibrant poets. And this one is four poets reading T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. I wanna tell you that we have uh, suddenly uh, in this building, an enormous collection uh, of poetry from Bob Dottilio's library. Come and check it out. Just a lot of poetry there for, for you to peruse. And David Gallette is actually organizing it and alphabetizing it. And um, there's a lot there to, to, to enjoy. The next Sunday, we have Mark Solomon, who has presented at Community Church maybe more than any other speaker um, uh, vying with uh, Howard Zinn and Noam Chomsky in how many presentations he's made it goes all the way back to 1960s, early mid mid 60s, when um, Mark was speaking against the Vietnam War. He's a retired government professor of um, from Simmons University here in Boston, and we are also. I urge you to come physically on that day because we are having. Uh, this is November 13th, an, a luncheon in honor of Mark Solomon, um, and we hope to get a bunch of his friends together as well as a bunch of us. We will have a lunch. Mark will be here physically present at the auditorium. We will broadcast and, uh, and we will celebrate his many decades uh, of, of service and involvement with Community Church of Boston, Professor Mark Solomon. November 20th, we have Trans Day of Rem Remembrance, which is something we uh, want to start observing on a regular basis, um, where we uh, remember our LGBT brothers and sisters, especially bi non-binary folks who have been at an un unusually large uh, rate murdered or, or assaulted not only in the city of Boston, but all over the country and the planet. It's, it's a travesty. And so we, we remember those folks on November 20, 20th. And then November 27th, Bob Dottilio Day. It's his second anniversary of his passing, and we have his legacy here in the church. We have his photographs, his mountain of books, his uh, Sacco and Vanzetti uh, archive, and so we will remember him on that day, and we're hoping to get a lot of a lot of folks, um, uh, friends friends of Bob's who are not members of the church, but uh, friends from his many phases of his life, to come here and remember him on that day. So, this is time for Amar Ahmad, and I'm just so glad to welcome Amar. It's been a pleasure working with Amar. Uh, I, I'm calling him a new member of our team at Community Church of Boston. Amar is helping us tons with our broadcast uh, piece, which is uh, an important part, hopefully more important part of what we do to the city of Boston, to the state of Massachusetts, to the country, to the planet, um, to broadcast our uh, what we do here and and preserve it on our on our YouTube channel as well as as for our own archives, and uh, to to also reach out to social media. I want to tell you about a, a visit that Amar and I had last week with. Um, the director of the Boston Neighborhood Network, which is an amazing facility that is the uh, cable access facility at, for the city of Boston. And they have um, a, a, a complete TV studio there and, and also a radio studio. And they, they did all the broadcasts to the Boston Public Schools during COVID and just an impressive place. And we're looking forward to working on that with them on a, on a bunch of things. Um, uh, providing them with, with content, not only from our live broadcast, but from our, our voluminous archives uh, that, that go back quite a few years. And um, it's just the beginning of a, a relationship. We've joined 
that uh, organization and we get now to check out really fancy camera equipment and learn how to use it to just make a more um, uh, gracious, beautiful and elegant uh, broadcast that doesn't have uh, tech glitches as we learn how to do it better and better. And Amar has been just really eager and helpful in, in all of those all of those things. Amar also is a, um, a member of the staff at Mass Peace Action, where he leads uh, webinars. And not only is he a, a savvy tech voice, but he's also an astute political voice, and he has um, arranged for a number of events for us to co-host with Mass Peace Action. So um, we're just really glad to uh, welcome Amar and, um, and welcome him for his own talk and our own introduction to who Amar is. His, uh, his talk for this morning is called God, John F. Kennedy, and Russia. And he calls himself a young Muslim who works with Community Church of Boston and Mass Peace Action, has interviewed esteemed writers and dissidents such as Margaret Kimberly, Daniel Ellsberg, and I'll add to that Julian Assange when we gave him the award last year, and, and many more. Um, Amar started a book reading group that read War with Russia by Stephen Cohen to better understand the new Cold War. Amar, take it away. Welcome and thank you. Great, great Dean, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Michael Jackson for joining us and thank you everyone who's here with us today. Uh, especially thank you everyone who came to the church. I'm sorry I couldn't make it today, but I'll, I'll be there for future Sundays. So, uh, you know, I, I was just working on uh, this old uh, audio cassette tape uh, from the church. Uh, this has, this audio cassette tape, it has a recording on it by uh, Rosa Parks, a talk that Rosa Parks gave to Community Church of Boston in 1982. And uh, she only spoke for a few minutes because she had a flight to catch, but still it's pretty cool that, uh, that she was there. So when Dean asked me if I would speak with Community Church of Boston, it's, it's actually an honor. Every time I come to the church, it's like I can feel the history. It's like the, the history of the church, it's like palpable. Uh, but this is this is special to me to speak here, not just because of the history of the church and the community, but also because it's it's a church. Technically, it's a it's a house of worship, and uh, and I'm and I'm a Muslim. I happen to be a Muslim, so uh, you know, in my life, I thought a lot about God and Christianity and Islam and Judaism and Buddhism and things like that. And, uh, you know, I thought about it and I read a little bit about it and whatever views I had, I tried my best to challenge them and look at things from a different way. And when I thought about God, I would think, uh, does God exist? Does God even exist? And uh, people who say that God doesn't exist, what, what if they're right? So, so, so I thought about that and I, and I, and I read about this stuff and I, I went through this uh, lifelong uh, journey procedure. And uh, by, by, by going through that process, uh, sometimes my views evolved and changed and sometimes my views uh, didn't change. They got strengthened and reinforced. So that's what happened with my belief in God. I, I actually came to understand that I actually do believe in God. I, I think that God actually exists. And I'm comfortable in that belief. I'm, I'm firm in that belief. And by studying Islam, what I learned was, by, by reading the Quran, what, what I came to learn was uh, about, about peace and love. That's what I learned was the message of God through uh, the Quran and through other scriptures. Uh, peace and love and uh, kindness and respect and gentleness and uh, honesty, integrity, all these sorts of things. So I'm going to take a second. Uh, Karen Armstrong is one of the leading scholars of religion and God in the world. Uh, and she used to be a Catholic nun. She's not anymore, but she was. Uh, I'm going to take a second to read, uh, just read a line from one of her books here. So Karen, Karen Armstrong wrote in the introduction of this book, uh, which is a biography on the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, she wrote that the Muslim scripture, the Quran, gave Muslims a mission to create a just and decent society in which all members were treated with respect. So I share that because 
<clears throat> I think she articulates well something that I learned from uh, studying Islam, that, that Muslims have a mission to create a just and peaceful society that treats all members with respect. She, so she's articulating this well, not, not just an individual responsibility to be honest and kind and that sort of stuff, but also a collective responsibility to build um, uh, a peaceful and just society for, for all of us. So, so I just share that because uh, that's how I ended up at Mass Peace Action. And that's how I ended up at then Community Church of Boston. Following that path, uh, that's what got me to Mass Peace Action and to Community Church of Boston. That's where I come from. So now fast forward to last year, 2021. And uh, I had been sitting alone in my room. I had been up all night and I was sitting alone in, in a room just like this. And uh, I'd been up, all, I'd been awake all night. And soon the night was going to turn into day. The sun was going to rise. And uh, wh wh while that was happening, the, outside my room, there was a tree. And uh, outside, uh, like on that tree, there was a bird. So I'm, I'm, I'm just sitting there in my room by myself. And uh, it's night and it's going to soon turn into day. And I start hearing this bird uh, sing a song. And, and the bird is singing a song outside of my room. And it was the most beautiful song I've ever heard in my life. It was just amazing music from this little bird boasting this magnificent song to the whole, to the whole grassland for all the creatures to hear. And, uh, and, and I was listening to it. And it sounded to me like the bird was singing uh, pra praises of God that uh, God is great, how great is God? And uh, God, because of God, now the sun will rise and, and the new day will come and then the sun will set and then the sun will rise again. Uh, so I'm listening to this bird sing the best song that I've ever heard, the best music like from a human or an animal or anywhere. And uh, I'm like, wow, this is uh, an amazing moment. So, so then uh, while, while that is happening, while, while that's happening, I start hearing another, I start hearing more sounds. So this bird was on one side of me and I couldn't see it, but I could hear it. And uh, then I started hearing sounds from another side of me. And I thought uh, that sounds like an animal, like, like a rodent. And it's, 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 it's almost as if that animal had been there the whole time, but I didn't even know. And, and, and then like, it was almost as if like God told the animal, like go make some noises now and reveal yourself to, to that human next to you. And, uh, and, and that's what happened. And so I'm sitting there with two animals on each side of me making noises that I could hear them, but I couldn't see them. And in that moment, <clears throat> a thought came to me. It was like a, a thought or a message. And that thought was, uh, God is all around me. That's the thought I had. And that was a really easy thought to accept because I had believed pretty much my whole life that God is omnipotent. God is all powerful. God is everywhere. So God, yeah, God is around me too, because God is everywhere. So I accepted that thought really easily. And uh, I'm just sitting there listening to the best music that anyone had ever heard. And then, then uh, it was in that moment, a second, a second message came to me, like from God. And uh, that, that message was, uh, while I'm sitting there listening to this song, uh, it's like this message came to me. And that message was, ask Ray McGovern about John Kennedy. And I thought, what? Ask, ask Ray McGovern about John Kennedy, what? Um, so let's just pause here for a second because uh, I had never really thought much about John Kennedy before. I knew who he was. I knew he was a president and he, he was killed. I'm from Massachusetts where everything, all the streets, everything is named John Kennedy, John Kennedy. But I never really thought much about John Kennedy before. And, uh, but, I, but I knew who Ray McGovern was. And uh, I, had this, I was working this job at MAPA doing this webinar thing. And I actually wanted to invite Ray McGovern for a webinar. So I thought about, so I just thought about John Kennedy. I'm like, yeah, that's right. You know, he, he was murdered, like he was assassinated. And, uh, and, and, and who did that? And, and, and why? Like, why, why would someone do that? Why would, why would someone kill a president of the United States? There had to be a reason. There's got to be some type of reason. But I don't know. So may, may, I guess Ray McGovern will explain all this to me. That's what I thought. So I went to sleep and then I woke up 
And I thought, uh, okay, all of that stuff that happened, that didn't really happen. I'm delusional. I'm making, like, I'm hallucinating. Like, uh, God didn't tell me to ask Ray McGovern about John Kennedy. That's not what happened. But, 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 but then I, uh, but I sat down and I wrote John, uh, Ray McGovern an email. And when we invite people to speak at events like webinars and whatnot, either they respond or they don't. It's like 50-50. So I sat down and I wrote the email to Ray McGovern, <clears throat> dear Ray McGovern, like, uh, thank you so much for everything you do. And uh, I'm writing from Massachusetts Peace Action. Like, we're just wondering, will you come and speak with us? And, and, and I thought like, he's not gonna respond. Like, I'll just write this email, but that's it, end of story. And, uh, but he responded, he responded like really quickly. And he said, yeah, sure, I'd love to come speak. Um, so I'm like, wow, that's great. And we're writing emails back and forth, trying to figure out logistics, the date and time he'll come speak with us. <clears throat> and at one point he asked me, he says, by the way, what, what, what do you want to talk about? What do you want me to talk about? And I was, I was like, look, I've never spoken to this guy, Ray McGovern, before. I can't just tell him, like, look, God told me to ask you about John Kennedy. And I, I didn't know how he would receive that. So I said to Ray, I wrote back in the email, I said, uh, look, Ray, like you were, you were, uh, in case people didn't know, he was a 27 year veteran of the CIA. So I wrote back to, uh, as an intelligence analyst, and I wrote back to him and I said, uh, Ray, you know, look, you were like CIA person for almost 30 years. And, uh, you know, you know, these cases of uh, Jeffrey Epstein and Whitey Bulger, they have really like shady, like nefarious ties with U.S. intelligence agencies, like, can you can you shed some light on this? Like, who who really killed uh, Jeffrey Epstein and and Whitey Bulger? And, and Ray Ray wrote me back an email. He said uh, he said Amar, you better call me. So so he sent me his number. He sent me his phone number, and uh, and eventually we connect on the phone. And uh, he's the first thing Ray said to me was on the phone. He said. Amar Ahmad, you're, you're Amar Ahmad from the Julian Assange thing, right? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I am. So just to pause here again, what he was referring to is what Dean alluded to earlier. In 2021, the Community Church of Boston, they awarded their annual Sacco and Vanzetti Award to Julian Assange. And since he's not there to receive it because the, he's in prison, the US is persecuting him, his, his brother and his father received our Sacco and Vanzetti Award. And I was really fortunate. I had the chance to uh, interview John and Gabriel Shipton, the father and brother of Julian Assange. Thanks, by the way, to Susan McLucas and Paula Isela and, and to Dean Stevens for giving me that opportunity. That was a really great time. And, and, and I, learned, uh, I, I learned that day, uh, you know, in the auditorium where Dean is now, what, what kind and gentle people uh, the Shiptons are, the family of Julian Assange. And I was actually heartbroken because uh, they spoke about their family member with so much love and all they wanted was for him to come home, for him to be free. And so even though it was really cool for me to be there and interview them, and that's also the same day I met Jill Stein, um, it was, it, the, the foundation of it was actually very sad that this is about Julian Assange who was in prison. So I just wanted to bring that up because when, when Joe Biden talks about the soul of the nation, the soul of our nation, I think that the soul of our nation can never even begin to heal until Julian Assange is back with his family. And, and Ray McGovern was there with us that day too, uh, virtually. So when he recognized me from that, someone that I look up to, uh, that was pretty cool. So he said, he said, you're Amar from the Julian Assange thing, right? He was like, good job with that. And I said, thanks, Ray. Uh, so we start talking about uh, what, what, what we want to talk about in the webinar program. And Ray actually didn't really want to talk about Jeffrey Epstein and Whitey Bulger because he said that, uh, he said, he, he, he doesn't have much more insight on it beyond what's already publicly available. So, so he just didn't really want to talk about it. I said, okay, look, Ray, that's fine. We don't have to talk about Jeffrey Epstein and Whitey Bulger, but what I really want to ask you, what I didn't mention in the email, but what I really want to ask you is about John Kennedy. Can we talk about John Kennedy? And Ray said, yeah, sure, we can talk about John Kennedy. Um, so just to pause here again, in my, in my mind, I thought that 
uh, God sent me a message to ask Ray McGovern about John Kennedy, a topic I don't know about. So, so, so Ray McGovern is going to break it down to me. He's an expert. He's a peace activist and he is a veteran of the CIA. He'll, he'll break down this whole situation to me, but that's not exactly what happened. What happened was Ray McGovern said, yeah, sure. We can talk about John Kennedy. Have you read JFK and the unspeakable by Jim James Douglas? And I said, no, I haven't. So after that conversation, I went out and I got a copy of this book, JFK and the Unspeakable by Jim Douglas, Why He Died and Why It Mattered by James Douglas with two S's at the end. And I, I didn't know who James Douglas was at the time. Uh, but I saw all these blurbs on the book. There's all these blurbs, uh, including from Daniel Ellsberg, someone I had interviewed. Uh, and D Dan Ellsberg is saying, actually, it was Dan Ellsberg's son, Robert Ellsberg, who was the publisher of this book. And Dan Ellsberg is saying, this is a really important book. Everyone should read this. This should be required reading. Uh, Oliver Stone. I had never even seen Oliver Stone's JFK film, but I saw other films by him. Oliver Stone. This is what Oliver Stone wrote about this book. He said, this is the best account I have read of this tragedy, this tragedy and its significance. But don't take my word for it. Read this extraordinary book and reach your own conclusions. And other people all at Mass Peace Action and Community Church of Boston, uh, all these people that are our friends and who we look up to as heroes and who come and speak at our events, people like Dan Ellsberg and Kathy Kelly, they're all saying, read this book. So I'm like, okay, cool. I'm, so, so I sat and I read this book. I read it um, for a few weeks or a couple months, I don't remember. And it was, it was, it was actually uh, amazing, life-changing, I, I like deeply profound. I can't even describe it. So I'm not going to try. So after I finished reading the book, uh, I, again, reached out to Ray McGovern. I said, Ray, thank you so much for introducing this book to me. I learned so much. Uh, th this is really important. Like, I, I want to put this information in front of Mass Peace Action, in front of as many people as I can. Can you put me in touch with James Douglas and so we can invite him to do an event? Uh, can, can you do that, Ray? And Ray said, Ray said look, James Douglas is really busy <clears throat> writing his next book. And James Douglas, is, this book was about John Kennedy. He's working right now on a book about uh, not just John Kennedy, but Robert Kennedy and, and uh, Mar Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X. And he's, he's writing about how all four of those people were basically murdered by, by the same people. So, uh, so Ray McGovern said to me, look, <clears throat> Jim Douglas is really busy writing his next book. Uh, so he's probably not going to be able to come and speak, but it doesn't hurt to ask. We'll ask him. So, so Ray said, write, write an invitation and I'll forward it to Jim, Jim Douglas. So I said, okay. I wrote the invitation and Ray forwarded it to Jim Douglas. Thank you, Ray, for doing that. And then uh, J Jim Douglas responded. He wrote back and he said, uh, he wrote a really nice email. He said, Amar, thank you so much. Um, I, I can't come speak because I'm working, I'm behind on my writing. But Ray McGovern said, I mean, Jim Douglas said, he said, um, I suggest you, you extend your invitation to, to my friend, Edward Curtin, my friend from Massachusetts, Edward Curtin. So give me one second. He said, I suggest you extend your invitation to my friend in Massachusetts, Edward Curtin. And J Jim Douglas said, Edward Curtin knows more about this topic than I do. And I thought, wow, okay, hold on. Dan Ellsberg and uh, all these people who are saying, read Jim Douglas's book. This is the best book on this topic. The guy who wrote that book is saying, talk to Ed Curtin. Ed Curtin knows more about this topic than I do. I didn't know who Ed Curtin was at the time, but he's from Western Mass and he's a writer and a thinker. And I visited his website, edwardcurtain.com, and I came to realize Ed is a really unique and special person. The way he understands things and writes about them, it's very unique. I haven't come across anyone like that. So I was very excited. I wanted to invite Edward Curtin to speak with us. That was the main thing I wanted to do at that time. And I was so excited. But where I was working at Mass Peace Action, there was a lot of concerns. They, uh, uh, people didn't want me to invite Ed Curtin to speak on this topic because the concern was that uh, 
we're going to engage in conspiracy theories and conspiracy theories delegitimize the, the so-called peace movement. Uh, de conspiracy theories harm the peace movement. That was the concern. So it actually wasn't easy to organize that program, but we went ahead and we organized the program anyways, because we're not afraid of controversial topics. We're not afraid of exploring our intellectual curiosity, what Dean earlier was calling a hunger for knowledge. We're not afraid of that. We're looking for truth and we're doing our best to understand it as we can and so that we can learn from those lessons and apply them to our lives and to our existence. So we went ahead and we did the uh, program with Ed Curtin and I'm so glad we did because when Ed Curtin came to speak with us, I introduced him, we did the webinar and I passed the floor to, I asked a question and gave him the floor. And the, the very first thing Edward Curtin says is, uh, yes, I'm going to answer that question. But first I noticed looking at the Zoom call, all the people who are present on the Zoom call, I see my friend uh, and Jim Douglas's friend, Marty Shops. And uh, I, I just wanna point out that Marty was a really important person in the investigation of the death of President John Kennedy. And that's the reason that Jim Douglas's book, uh, JFK and the Unspeakable, it's actually dedicated to Marty Schatz and Vince Salandria. And I'm sitting there listening to this. I'm, I'm like dumbfounded. I'm like, Marty Schatz, are you serious? Uh, I had known Marty for months through mass peace action. We were part of uh, a no cold war group where we're trying to do no cold war with Russia and China. So I'd known Marty for months, but I hadn't, even though I read this book, I completely overlooked the fact that it was, it was actually dedicated to, to, to Marty Schatz and Vince Salandria. This book is dedicated to Vince Salandria and Marty Schatz, teachers and friends. So even though I knew Marty, I never would have known about this part of him had I not gone through this whole experience from Ray McGovern to reading this book to doing the public talk with Ed Curtin and now back to Marty. And me and Marty, we became much closer. And then I learned that Marty actually wrote his own book about this stuff in, I think, 96, like in the 90s. It's called History Will Not Absolve Us by, by, by Martin Schultz. And this book actually, uh, it's available digitally online for free. Anyone can access this book. Uh, so I read this book. And then we did a, then we did a public uh, book talk. We did an event about this book, me and Marty. And uh, there, there was so much positive interest, so much everybody was so like interested in this topic and loved it. And uh, th so there was so much interest that what we did was we created a group, a JFK Peace Group. And I'll talk more about that later, but we created our JFK Peace Group. And since then our JFK Peace Group has done its own events. <clears throat> we screened uh, John Kennedy's uh, 1963 speech at American University. It's kind of an important speech. And uh, that event had like 100 people, people from Europe and South America, speaking very powerfully about um, what John Kennedy had meant to them. And we have more events coming up actually, uh, November 21st this year. So anyways, a so, 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 so a bird sang a song outside my room that marked for me the start of a journey that took me from Ray McGovern to Jim Douglas's book, back to Ray McGovern, to Ed Curtin, to Marty Schultz, the JFK Peace Group, and who know, only God knows where we're next, okay? So, uh, so yesterday I was actually thinking, I was like, I was thinking, I'm like, what, like, what should I say tomorrow to Community Church of Boston? I don't even know what to say. Like, what should I even say? So I thought, I was like, God, help me figure, let me, give me something to say to the Community Church of Boston. Let me open this book to a random page. And whatever page you, God, open this book to that's random, I'll, I'll read that part. So I did that. And uh, it, it opened to page 263, 264. So I'm going to take a second and read from that. Here goes. <clears throat> At the July 20th, 1961 National Security Council meeting, General Hickey, chairman of the Net Evaluation Subcommittee of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, <clears throat> presented a plan for a nuclear surprise attack on the Soviet Union in, quote, in, in late 1963, preceded by a period of heightened tensions. 
<clears throat> other presenters at the preemptive strike plan included General Lyman Lemitzer, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, CIA Director Alan Dulles, and CIA Director Alan Dulles. Vice President Lyndon Johnson's military aide Howard Burris wrote a memorandum on the meeting for Johnson, who was not present. According to the Burris memorandum, President Kennedy raised a series of questions in response to the first strike presentation he heard. <clears throat> he asked about the preemptive attacks likely damage to the USSR, its impact if launched in 1962, and how long US citizens would have to remain in fallout shelters following such an attack. While the Burris memorandum is valuable in its revelation of the first strike agenda, it does not mention Kennedy's ultimate disgust with the entire process. We know that fact first from its disclosure in an oral history by Roswell Gilpatrick, JFK's Deputy Secretary of Defense. <clears throat> Gilpatrick described the meeting's abrupt conclusion, quote, finally Kennedy got up and walked out in the middle of it and that was the end of it, end quote. Kennedy's dis disgusted reaction to this National Security Council meeting was also recorded in books written by Arthur Schesslinger Jr., Mick George Bundy, and Dean Rusk. Um, Kennedy didn't just walk out. He also said what he thought of the entire proceeding. As he led Secretary of State Dean Rusk back to the Oval Office uh, with what Rusk described as, quote, a strange look on his face, Kennedy turned and said to his Secretary of State, and we call ourselves the human race. And we call ourselves the human race was directed especially at the we, himself included, who had been seriously discussing a preemptive nuclear strike on millions of other humans, at least until he was so revolted by the process he left the room. His walkout couldn't have pleased his military and CIA chiefs. Nevertheless, the judgment Kennedy made, and we call ourselves the human race, continued to apply to himself as he became increasingly ensnared in his national security state's nuclear war plans. <clears throat> in the late winter of 1962, Thomas Martin was finishing writing Peace in the Post-Christian Era. At the same time, Kennedy was being overcome by mounting Cold War pressures. <clears throat> Martin could see what was happening. He wrote that, quote, the influence of the hard school is more and more evident. Whereas President Kennedy used to assert that the United States would never strike first, he is now declaring we may have to take the initiative in the first use of nuclear weapons. Okay, so there's a lot going on in that excerpt. They're discussing, uh, they're discussing a first, uh, first nuclear strike and, uh, and, and Kennedy was a part of that. So there's actually a lot of takeaways and reflections from that. But one of them that I'll share right now is that when, when I developed this interest and uh, started talking about it and started talking about it publicly, uh, there was a lot of reactions from people. And uh, the, the, the main reaction was actually uh, th thank you, Amar, good job, Amar. Like I, I remember when John Kennedy was killed and uh, this means a lot to me, this is really important. Thank you for doing this. That was overwhelmingly the biggest reaction. Uh, but there was also another reaction uh, from like leftists and uh, academics and uh, communists and uh, activists and organizers. And uh, their reaction, a, lo a lot of their reaction was, <clears throat> Kennedy was an imperialist and a co co colonist, a militarist. That's it, end of story, nothing to see here who killed him and why, it doesn't matter because Kennedy was just an imperialist just like the rest of them. So, I mean, in that passage I just read, we're clearly seeing that he was sitting in a meeting where they're talking about uh, a, a nuclear first strike on the Soviet Union that would kill millions of people. So, so of course, like he was an imperial, like there, no, nobody's doubting that. He was the president of the United States. He was president of the US empire, of the imperial US empire. And uh, no, 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 nobody's doubting that, nobody's questioning that. When you're in that position, there's no, there's no doubt that you're doing things that are not justifiable morally, ethically. 
so, but the remarkable thing about John Kennedy's story is that he, uh, he even though he was a cold warrior, arguably the biggest cold warrior because he was the president and he had all these pressures, the entire weight of the US empire was something he was carrying. Um, and for example, when the Cuban Missile Crisis happened, <clears throat> what he did by blockading Cuba, uh, that's not something that many of us agree with, but also his advisors around him, they wanted him to go a lot further. They wanted him to invade Cuba and drop a nuclear bomb on Cuba. And he actually resisted that. So uh, no one's doubting that he was did not good things as head of the imperial US empire. But the remarkable part of his story is that even with all those Cold War pressures, pressures beyond what we face, uh, he was able to turn towards peace. He actually did turn towards peace. And uh, the first thing he did was start to think about peace. And then he started to talk about it. And then he started to act on it. For example, with the nuclear test ban treaty. For example, with his executive order to pull troops out of Vietnam. Yes, he was going to end the war in Vietnam. He said as much to the head of the Marines and he said as much to his friends in the Senate and the House. He was just waiting for the 1963 election. But even before that, he signed executive orders to pull troops out of Vietnam. So no one's doubting uh, that Kennedy did signed off on bad things, really bad things, murder and imperialism in Cuba and Vietnam and other places. But, but he, he, he did turn, he was going through a spiritual journey and he was turning towards peace. <clears throat> and he knew that in the process of doing that, he was risking his life. And ultimately he sacrificed his life. So that's what happened with John Kennedy. So for organizers and activists, left-wing people, communists now, uh, to say that Kennedy was just an imperialist and a colonialist and end of story, it doesn't matter who killed him and why. Noam Chomsky says that too. No, Noam Chomsky is actually wrong about that. Um, it doesn't make you radical to point out the bad imperial things that John Kennedy did. Everybody knows that. That goes without saying. He was the president of the United States. What makes you a radical is to understand that people can do the worst things that people can do but there can still be redemption. They can still do better. So that's what I had to say about John Kennedy and um, the lessons I learned. You know, it's pe pe people talk, there, there's a lot of talk right now. I've, I've heard this a lot recently <clears throat> with this crisis in Ukraine and Russia. Uh, th there's a lot of analogies to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, rightly so. But it, it's an, if we don't understand why John Kennedy was killed, why he died and why it matters, the lesson of the Cuban Missile Crisis is incomplete. Okay, what, what John Kennedy was doing, uh, especially after the Cuban Missile Crisis, actually, he started, uh, he started uh, doing more talks, he was literally talking with Khrushchev in the Soviet Union <clears throat> and when Fidel Castro in Cuba. And just that act was, was not allowed in his government. He had to do it in secret because if he did it openly, uh, there, there would be too much backlash. So, so he, was, he was talking in secret with Fidel Castro and with Khrushchev. And he said some remarkable things. <clears throat> he told Castro that the Cuban revolution was justified, that John Kennedy, the president of the US, thinks that the revolution that Castro led with Che Guevara, that it was, it was justified morally. That's in writing, okay? That's remarkable. But he also said some other things I don't agree with. And Castro wrote back. And Castro said some things that I agree with. So anyways, when John Kennedy was killed on November 22nd, 
the very next day, <clears throat> Fidel Castro gave a speech to the nation of Cuba and, and, and submitted that speech to the UN. There's a record of it. People might have read it um, or they might not have. So in that speech, Fidel Castro logically deduced, he used his logical deduction to uh, deduce who killed John Kennedy. And history has proven him right. He, was, he, he said this publicly the day after Kennedy was killed on November 23rd. The way he put it was uh, the, mo the most reactionary forces of the United States. That's what he called it, the, the people who killed Kennedy. So what I'm saying is when Noam Chomsky says one thing and Fidel Castro says something else and they're not in agreement, it's up to us. What do we think about this? This is actually an important part of history and an important part of who we are today. So what I'm saying is Noam Chomsky's wrong and Fidel Castro and Jim Douglas and Ray McGovern and Oliver Stone are right on this issue of John Kennedy. And, 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 and you guys can decide for yourselves. I'm not here trying to tell anyone what to think about John Kennedy. All I'm doing is sharing what I think and how I got here. And, and part of that was reading this book. People could read this or, or, re, or, or read this book. There's a lot, there's a lot of books. So uh, they could, but they, they don't have to read those books. They could read Fidel Castro's speech from 1963, November 23rd, because Ca Castro was right. So anyways, I, I, I read another book from Jim Douglas. This one was about Gandhi. It's called Gandhi and the Unspeakable. His, fi his, his final experiment with the truth. And, and this book, it's much, it's much shorter than his JFK book. This was actually supposed to be the introduction to his next book about Malcolm X and Dr. Martin Luther King and JFK and RFK. This was gonna be the introduction, but they printed it as its own book. And I, I never knew much about Gandhi until I read this. And this was remarkable, okay? One of, one of, one of the things described in this book was that um, got, sometimes people, Gandhi was also killed violently. But even, even before that, sometimes Gandhi was uh, attacked physically. People would attack him. Sometimes they would throw, throw things at him. <clears throat> the people who would attack Gandhi, sometimes they got caught. And when, when, they, when they got caught, people would ask Gandhi like, do you wanna press charges? Do you wanna bring them to the police and go through court and press charges? And Gandhi's response to that was, no, no, I don't want to press charges against this person who physically assaulted me. And uh, people would ask him why. They're trying, they're trying to kill you. Like, well, like, so that's, that's, you know, press charges. And Gandhi said, no, we're not going to press charges because, yes, we don't agree with what those people are doing, using violence and whatnot, <clears throat> but they're only doing what they think is right. They're only doing what they think is right. So I'm not gonna hold that against them, even though they're attacking me. So when I read that, I'm like, wow, that's so deep and profound. That reminds me of uh, when I would read about the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, when th th the same thing would happen to him. His uncle, his paternal uncle, Abu Lahab, would physically attack him. They were afraid, the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was preaching monotheism at a time when uh, there was a lot of polytheism and they were, the, the ruling elites of his time and era, they were worried that his message would hurt them financially. It would hurt trade and it would hurt, uh, it would hurt travel to, their, to, to, to Mecca. So he faced a lot of vitriol and sometimes he would be attacked and including by his paternal uncle and uh, his response was he wouldn't fight back. So that reminded me of what I read about Gandhi. And I just thought that, look, we're peace activists here in Massachusetts. We have a peace abbey that actually has a statue of Gandhi. The, the, the impression I got from reading this book was Gandhi wouldn't condemn people. He didn't condemn the Imperial British Empire when violence was breaking out between Hindus and Muslims in India, and there's a lot of pressure on him 
to condemn the Muslims who were doing violence against Hindu people, he wouldn't do it. He he uh, he put them he put himself in their shoes and tried to look at the situation from their perspective. That's a very valuable lesson. And that's what I think is missing from this current conflict in Russia, Ukraine, NATO, United States, the conflict that's happening right now. I spent a lot of time with this in mass peace action and there's a lot of controversy and debate about this in our communities and, and outside more broadly. And the dominant narrative here is that Russia invaded Ukraine, Russian aggression, authoritarian Russian dictator, Vladimir Putin is evil, pretty much evil. He's, he's Hitler, basically, close to Hitler. That's, that's like the dominant narrative. And I didn't, I didn't really know much about Russia and Ukraine. But that, that, that was the time I, re I started uh, this book club where we read War with Russia by Steve Cohen. And when people read this, they said this should be required reading for everyone. And if anyone doesn't know who Steve Cohen is, he's a total Russia expert. He speaks Russian. He was CBS news correspondent for Russia, uh, about Russia for years. Like he was friends with Dan Rather, Professor Emeritus at Princeton. So what Stephen Cohen presented in this book, it was completely different than what I had constantly heard from our media and from our institutions of education and also our activist organizations about Russia. What Stephen Cohen is saying in this book is <clears throat> Vladimir Putin's actually a legitimate leader of Russia. And he actually has uh, a lot of popular support. And, and, and Russia, both Putin and, and Russia and Putin, their head of state, they have legitimate grievances against the US. That it's from that book I learned that the US did a coup in Ukraine. And then some years went by, and then we did another coup in Ukraine in 2014. I learned that the US is putting missiles in Poland and Romania and Ukraine on the border of Russia, missiles capable of nuclear weapons. And I learned some of the history about Russia how it had been invaded so many times in its history through Ukraine, like with Nazi Germany, like with Napoleon, et cetera, et cetera. These were things I never learned about in the, in the US media. So when this uh, conflict escalates in February of this year, there's, there's a lot of uh, talk about it. They're, they're, this is the biggest issue globally of the year. And, uh, and I was working at Mass Peace Action. Actually, I was chairing the Cold, No Cold War group, No Cold War with Russia and China. And what immediately happened was everybody, everybody, including the leftists, including the peace activists, everybody across the board started condemning Russia condemning Russia strongly. And I thought, look, I don't know what it's like to be a head of state, but if I was, I imagine if I was head of state of a nation and if another nation was putting missiles on the border of my country that had nuclear weapons, and, and if they're doing coups in, the countries that are my neighbors. That actually seems like a legitimate grievance. When Russia says that this war that they're waging is a war of self-defense, that they feel that this is existential for their existence, they're fighting for their self-defense and this is existential to them because the US is placing nuclear weapons all across their border, I think that that sounds reasonable, that sounds legitimate. And to me, at least, but that, that, that was missing from our whole dialogue, even from the peace activists, the ones who, we, we have a statue of Gandhi at the Peace Abbey. 
and Gandhi would engage in empathy and compassion and put himself in the other person's perspective and see things from their way. But we weren't doing that. What we were doing was tripping over each other to see who could condemn Russia more strongly. Who, in other words, who was more anti-Russian? So, uh, look, I'm not here to tell anyone what to think about Russia and Ukraine. I'm sharing what I think and how I got here. But if all we hear is a mainstream dominant narrative about how evil Vladimir Putin is and Russian invasion, Russian aggression, and if, if you don't at least expose yourself to an alternative perspective, like from Steve Cohen, like from Doug McGregor, like from Scott Ritter, if you don't at least expose yourself to an alternative perspective, I'm not saying you have to agree with it, but if you don't expose yourself to it, you've only done yourself a disservice. And that goes for us uh, collectively in our organizations as well. So, That's pretty much my message here to look at Russia, look, look, look at the situation from Russia's perspective. And when, when, we're, we're waging a proxy war on Russia. We are, we are waging a war on Russia. As I said, we have missiles all across their border. We did a coup in Ukraine. We did another coup in Ukraine. Uh, even now, we, we fund Ukraine with the billions of dollars, billions and billions of dollars to fight Russia. And it's, it's very clear, it's very obvious, the motivation for that is not at all to save Ukrainians, to help Ukrainians with self-defense against Russia. That's not why our government is funding them. Our government is funding them so that they can die fighting against Russia. They can, Lindsey Graham said it himself, they'll fight to the last Ukrainian. People are saying this openly. We, we don't care if they fight to the last Ukrainian. The, the objective here is to weaken Russia, not to help Ukraine, to weaken Russia, okay? There's a distinction there. And, and, and for us uh, who, who understand this or who kind of understand this, instead of try, trying, at least trying, to share and spread this knowledge, what we're diverting our precious time and energy towards is talking about how bad Vladimir, how bad how bad Vladimir Putin is. But that there's an irony there. There's an irony and hypocrisy there. We are American citizens. We have no right to talk about how bad any other country is. We're the ones who are citizens of a country and taxpayers in a country and sometimes voters in a country that's doing the most harm in the world. And that's been the case for my whole life. That's been the case since before I was born. So so to the extent we talk about Russia and Ukraine, it has to be that we need to get back into the INF treaty. We need to get back into the ABM treaty. We were the ones who walked out of the treaties and then put missiles right on Russia's border. All of that context is missing. It's our job to talk about that, not to talk about how bad Vladimir Putin is. When we do that, all we do is we set the stage for our democratic leaders to uh, further send billions of weapons, uh, our tax, hard-earned taxpayer money to Ukraine to weaken Russia. But Russia is not our enemy, and we shouldn't be at war with Russia, even though that's where our policymakers are taking us. Our democratic leaders, they keep on signing off on more and more billions of weapons to Ukraine. In other words, they're literally warmongering. In other words, in a biblical word, what they're doing is satanic. They're, what they're doing is satanic. And if we follow our democratic leaders, where they'll lead us is straight to hell. That's where we're going. When I uh, sit back and try to understand what's happening right now with the US waging a proxy war on Russia and, and us, all of us becoming closer and closer to nuclear war and nuclear annihilation, what I think of is the stories I read about in the Quran, the stories and uh, the lessons I learned from the stories, lessons about human arrogance and human hubris. And that's what the United States is engaging in by doing this proxy war with Russia, risking nuclear war, thinking there's some of us, our policymakers, who think we could win a nuclear war with Russia. If we just strike first and if we strike harder, we could win a nuclear war with Russia. That's hubris. 
And uh, if we are condemning Russia as peace activists, as leftists or whatever, then we're, we're, we're helping that. We're helping set the stage for that. Just like so many of us did since 2016, when Donald Trump got elected and uh, the dominant narrative was that, the dominant narrative was that Vladimir Putin hacked our elections and delivered us Donald Trump. We, we, we bought into this anti-Russia, this totally false Russiagate narrative. And uh, journalists like Aaron Mate, Matt Taibbi, others, they've completely exposed this as a total fraud. Glenn Greenwald, uh, everybody knows the Russiagate thing was a fraud. But it was us, the progressives and the liberals and the leftists, who supported that because we were anti-Trump. Well, that was wrong. What I learned from this book about Gandhi was Gandhi believed that the ends don't justify the means. Um, that, that I mean... Yeah, the, end, the ends don't justify the means. If we want to oppose Trump, we can't do it in this anti-Russia, totally false Russiagate way. We, we, we should do it in a, in, a, in, a, in a more proper way. And uh, we're never going to achieve peace with Russia as long as we condemn them. We have to empathize. We have to use empathy and compassion, and we have to engage in accountability and understand how it is our country and our leaders who caused this conflict and therefore, it's them, it's us who have the, the power to end this conflict, okay? So that's my message. Uh, the one person who knew how to make peace with Russia was Stephen Cohen. And Stephen Cohen is dead now. So it's up to us. Thank you, Amar. Lots to think about and lots to talk about. Um, we are we are already at, at twelve twenty seven, and we'll have a little bit of time for for Q and A. Maybe we can go uh, even go over. But um, uh, first, uh, a couple of things um, before uh, bringing back Michael for for one last um, poem slash song slash thought. Um, uh, I wanna let you know that uh, on November 19th, it's a Saturday night, we will physically have here at the church, Scott Ritter himself, who, who Amar mentioned, in, and it will also be broadcast as a web webinar. And I hope you can come and um, hear, hear that really important voice in this, in this very moment um, with, with this conflict with Russia and, and Ukraine. Um, so that's November 19th. Um, another thing I wanna tell you about is that we are sending out lots of these postcards from Community Church. Um, they are hand addressed to a list that came to us. I'm not sure if it was from 350.org or Move On or Daily Coast. All of them are doing this postcard stuff and you, you, you write the letter by hand and you stamp it and you put your return address. And um, it's supposedly one of the very most effective get out the vote techniques. Um, so if you want to come and help, Monday, Wednesday, Friday are our office hours and we're here and you can come and address and uh, stamp envelopes uh, or postcards for us to send. So those two things um, wanted to let you know. And uh, so we will, after, after Michael have a Q and A, also wanna let you know that we will put in the information for you to, to uh, um, join in, in the, the collection plate. Um, we are a, a church and a building with a lot of lot of needs and immediate and long-term building needs um, you can you can help at our website which uh, uh, accepts PayPal and credit cards or you can send um, a, a check the, the old way or you can come be here physically and we will actually pass a physical plate around and and we even take cold cash from you or even warm cash if it's been sitting in your in your wallet the whole time. So Michael, will you take us take us to uh, the Q&A? And thanks again for joining us from New Mexico. Absolutely. Take it, Michael. All right, this last piece is called For the Youth. And I spent a, a significant portion of my professional career as a teacher. And all of those years that I spent teaching, 
um, working with the kids definitely inspired me. So this last piece is called For the Youth, and it goes like this. <clears throat> with or without the lots, you can't put me in a box. Too forward to be stopped. I'm in orbit. I won't drop. The door is unlocked, so when opportunity knocks, that's one less second I'm not wasting to reach the top. My mental frequency is always turning. I'm up a notch. For the vermin, I'm keeping watch. Watchful eye. Some of my students live on my block. And birds aren't the only thing flying when it gets hot. I refuse to let the future be the past. I'm not guided by the cash. This is for who doesn't have it. It's for the children who've been blinded by the ads. So much info passes, the lies travel the fastest. I remain true to myself. One love to my brethren. I hope the love is spreading like infection. It's too much hate when all our lives are in question. Why not love when every day is a blessing? Thank you. You're muted, Dean. Thank you, Michael. It's been really great having you here today. And thank you for what you've added to this program. Um, Amar, um, I want to ask you so many questions. Um, but uh, the, just the first one is about Islam. Um, before we get to all the political stuff, and maybe I'll just ask this one question and uh, forget the other ones. Um, we have a, a group that used to meet here, has not contacted us after the COVID uh, situation, but they were called Muslims for Progressive Values. They still are, and they still, they still are a national organization. And um, we've sort of been probing into, into them. And um, your, your talk uh, about Islam as uh, a liberating force is something that really um, touches me and makes me want to find out more. Um, I, uh, I subscribe to the liberation theology part of, of Catholicism or the radical evangelical part of my uncle's, who is a very well-known Latin American theologian. Um, his, he passed away recently. His, his message to evangelicals, um, which, is, which is about... Um, liberation and about not listening to, not having to hear the, the message of, of uh, freedom and liberation from the powers above you that supposedly have the true message all the way from God, from being able to read the, um, uh, the great um, books and, and draw, draw your own conclusions, be you a, a scholar or be you a, 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 a a, a campesino in in uh, Nicaragua or in in El Salvador. So um, the the question is is you know just like with Christianity, there are some uh, countries that claim to be Islamic uh, driven and theocracies basically. Just like there's a Jewish theocracy and there's some Christian theocracies that are horrifically oppressive places for women. We think of what's going on in Iran right now. Um, and um, so uh, I suppose it's the same message as, um, uh, as with Christianity, you know, sort of um, there's, there's a Unitarian Universalist wing of Islam that, that says that you, you, there's, there's a different message. I wonder if, if we could learn more about that message and about what the Quran says and about liberation in, in Islam. Yeah, thank, thank you, Dean. Um, the, 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 the first thing to say here is that uh, in the United States, especially after 9-11 and having gone through this uh, war, war on terror and uh, the, the propaganda that came with it, we, we've all been programmed in such a way where like American people, Western people, for the most part, uh, we're, we're actually not able to talk about this, like honestly and uh, un, uh, without bias. We, we, we've like been programmed to have such bias that uh, our, our starting point in this conversation is very difficult. What I'll say is 
uh, Islam fund fundamentally at its core is uh, at least as far as I understand is is um, it's it's you could call it a left wing movement for human rights. Okay, it's uh, you could you could you could call it a social. My, I plenty of Muslims say that Islam is fundamentally socialist. Uh, okay, for example, let me just give an example real quick. Like Karen Armstrong, one of the leading scholars of religion in the world, in this book, Muhammad. I read this book in like a day. It's not it's not long. Uh, she this is a biography of the Holy Prophet, a very short biography of the Holy Prophet. And in that, what she describes is you could read that and you could think that she's talking about the times we're living in today. She's describing uh, a society of haves and have nots of a wealthy elite that has uh, all the resources and all the power and uh, a, a majority that is poor and destitute and, and, and their struggle for uh, peace and freedom and liberation. Okay, and in that, uh, if you read the Quran, like one of the themes is, I have this copy of the Quran right here. And what I used to do with this copy was uh, every time it would say something about like, that it's our duty as some, if we're more fortunate, that it's our duty to extend our efforts and our time towards those who are less fortunate. Every time there was like some sort of reference to that made, I highlighted it in this book. So it has a lot of highlights. So it's, it's, it's a theme of Islam to, uh, that if you're a society, a collective society, the responsibility of the society is to uh, uplift or protect or take care of the most vulnerable among us. And uh, at that time and at that era, and even still that, that included women, like all, all women. Uh, so when you read the Quran and especially in the context of that time and place, this was a movement that uh, was giving greater rights to women and to uh, people who were physically disabled, who were disabled, uh, discriminated against the, that society, people who were poor, people who were blind, people who were orphans. There was a lot of discrimination against. So, you know, one of the things Karen Armstrong does in this book, and she's a British woman, she used to be a Catholic nun. And one, one of the things she does is, uh, debunk all the Islamophobia in the West, like these, these myths that Islam is fundamentally anti-woman. And she uses her historical scholarship to describe how uh, profound and deep women's rights came first through Islam to Saudi Arabia, uh, to Arabia, before they ever reached Europe. They, some, some of those didn't come to Europe till many, many centuries later. And uh, so that's my quick question, answer to your question, Jane. So that, that Islam, it's fundamentally left-wing, liberating human rights uh, for all the uh, marginalized uh, communities of the world. And you could read about that in the Quran or from Karen Armstrong. Dean? Leonard, do you have a question? I, 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 I have something to say and then I have to leave in two minutes because we're doing a, a show at one o'clock that everybody's invited to. Um, the, um, uh, I wanted to say about the, uh, Russia and, and Ukraine, yes, it's very important that we understand, as Amar has said, the background and uh, both sides of this conflict. Um, there's an important article that appears in New York, New York Times this morning by John Malcheri about the, the assassination of a Ukrainian conductor who refused to uh, uh, conduct a, a, a Russian glorification program. And, and what he says at the end of the, of, of the um, uh, article is appropriate to what I'm going to say now. He talks about the Jews of Ukrainian uh, of descent from people in Ukraine that emigrated to the United States that made the musical scene. He talks about Leonard Bernstein and Bernard Herrmann and uh, Elmer Bernstein and, and um, George Gershwin. And, and he could have actually mentioned Mark Blitzstein and Leonard Lehrman. I just realized today that each of us was named after our grandfather who came from Odessa in Ukraine, each one of us. And uh, the reason that's relevant is that the uh, the staged orchestral premiere of Sacco and Vanzetti, thanks in, in large part to uh, support from Bob Dettiel and the community church, is happening at one o'clock today on Zoom. And you can uh, be invited. There, we're close to 100 people, but people can still come. Please send us an email message at Court Street Music Valley Stream at gmail.com. It's in the chat. And now I have to go and set that up because uh, we're starting at probably one o'clock and then and we're convening in the next two minutes. Okay, thank you, Dean. And I hope you'll be joining. Will you be joining us, Dean?
Thank you, Leonard. Um, well, we'll be doing a luncheon right here at the church uh, that I have to help serve. And then I will be with my mother, uh, age 96, um, the rest of the afternoon. But anybody who wants, uh, send, a, right. we were send an to email to okay. that Thank email that's in the chat. Thank you for all your support. Jerry, Jerry okay. Kaplan and David Rothhauser have signed up and other members of the, you know, the Sacco Vanzetti uh, uh, Commemoration Society. So we hope very to see good. more. Thank you very much, Dean. All right. And we'll, uh, we'll look for it on YouTube as well. Okay. It'll be there. Yeah. Um, let me uh, just go through a couple of things in the, uh, in the chat. Um, there's a one o'clock, uh, whoops, 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 um, a standout. 2 p.m. today, Davis Square, Somerville, against the blockade. I assume that's the Cuba blockade. Um, uh, and uh, many thank yous to Amar uh, for his work at M Mass Peace Action. Another uh, interesting event from Susan Nye saying it's November 6th. November 16, no, that, yes, 16 November, 7 p.m. Uh, the title of the program is Why Supporting Palestinian Rights and Opposing Israeli Apartheid is Not Anti-Semitic. And there's a, there's a Zoom um, link right there. Uh, a, a comment from Richard, if today's progressives had been around at the time to scold Kennedy about how peace and diplomacy are to be avoided because they uh, because they're signs of weakness and indications of being a Russian dupe, and that forever wars are progressive and humanitarian acts, and that Cuba is an abomination, would we even be here? Thank you, Richard, for that comment. Um, uh, uh, Amar, any any reactions to to anything of what you've heard in the chat so far? And anybody else who has a question, put your put your hand up in the Zoom or or put it in the chat. Yeah, uh, I, I was just responding to Sandy's message in the chat, but I'll do that in a second. Uh, just just one other thing I wanted to share, which in my mind is very connected, uh, is that. Uh, somewhat unrelated from the topic, but connected in my mind, that, 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 that our time is our most precious resource for all of us. Time is our most precious resource. And something I've learned is that every day is a challenge and every day is a test. And in my case, sometimes I haven't passed that test. Sometimes I've failed. I've wasted days. Uh, but 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 not today, okay? What I'm going to do today is exercise and read and write and take time out of my day to pray to God and to go outside. It's so sunny out right now. I'm going to go outside and let my uh, body, my skin absorb the sun and make vitamin D and all the other neural... Uh, physiological processes that'll take place. And later in the week, I'm going to go spend time with my family and I'm going to meet with Michael Jackson and we're, we're, we're going to work on a project that uh, potentially could be uh, changing the world and uh, dropping people's jaws and whatnot. Uh, so that, that's just my message that time is our most important resource. And whenever someone passes away, the people who love them always say that uh, I, I wish I had spent more time with them. And, uh, but we have that opportunity now, we have it today. So uh, use your time responsibly, spend your time with the people you love and, and, and appreciate, have gratefulness and appreciate uh, the magnificent nature that we've been gifted. Uh, the, the sun and the moon and the trees and the wind. Uh, this is a very precious gift. So I find a lot of value in thinking about that. Thank you, Amar. Like I say over and over, life is too short and then you die. <laughs> so drink in every delicious moment as it comes at you and try to help those who are 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 not as as um laden with luck and gifts as you are um uh, charlie you have a question yes um i know um 
Amar has already uh, basically given his answer on this, but I can't not talk about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Kennedy ran to the right of Nixon, claiming there was a missile gap, and he set the whole atmosphere up for the Cuban Missile Crisis. He, uh, he, um, Khrushchev felt that he had to gamble to put missiles into Cuba because of the imbalance uh, in power, and uh, that you know that whole setup w was what caused the Cuban Missile Crisis, which almost blew us all away. I, I, I can appreciate that Kennedy might have been bright enough to realize that there were all sorts of contradictions in his problems, but he brought us to that point. And um, I, can't, I keep remembering the words of Malcolm X that it was the chickens coming home to roost in yeah. some senses. Yeah, thanks, Charlie. Uh, th thank you for bringing that up. Uh, and, you know, when I was reading the correspondence, the written correspondence between John Kennedy and Fidel Castro, uh, hold on, there's some background noise here. Okay, that's better. Uh, when I was reading the written correspondence between John Kennedy and Fidel Castro, I thought it was remarkable that John Kennedy said to Castro that, in John Kennedy's opinion, the Cuban revolution was justified. So I thought that was remarkable. But what I disagreed with what John Kennedy said to Castro was he put the blame of the Cuban Missile Crisis and jeopardizing all life on Earth. He put the blame of that on Castro. He said to Castro, uh, thanks to what you're doing, you like jeopardized all of us uh, with your uh, bringing these missiles into Cuba. And I'm paraphrasing. And I thought, why is John Kennedy saying that? That's not the Castro's fault. Cuba was the one who kept getting invaded by the U.S. What they were doing was could be argued was self-defense. And and same with uh, the Soviet Union. We had our missiles in Turkey and all around the Soviet Union. Uh, so why is John Kennedy blaming Castro for the Cuban Missile Crisis when it was clearly our fault? And, and, and that's what Castro said back to Kennedy, actually. When Castro corresponded back to Kennedy, that's what he said, that, look, we were just basically doing self-defense. It's not our fault. You were the ones invading us. And I agree with Castro on that. So, uh, you know, to your point, again, Charlie, we're in agreement that J J John Kennedy was the head of state of an imperial U.S. empire that did terrible things. They did terrible things before him and after him and under his leadership. So that no, no one is in dispute of that, okay? And for you to say that it, he caused the Cuban Missile Crisis, I agree, I agree. Um, but ultimately, ultimately he did change and that's document, or he was in the process of changing and that's documented in Jim Douglas's book. And, and he knew while he was doing that, that he was risking his life and he was okay with it. And this is what he was killed for. This is why John Kennedy was killed. The fact that he was even negotiating with Castro and with Khrushchev, that is in itself remarkable because in our Cold War culture, that wasn't allowed. That wouldn't have been allowed by Alan Dulles and the CIA and the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Uh, but, but he did it anyways. And, uh, and, and, and he did the nuclear test ban treaty. He made a treaty with Russia saying, let's stop detonating our nuclear bombs across the world which are damaging to our environment and it's like very damaging also morally and and he did that and that's remarkable when he did that everyone was saying kennedy is weak on communism he's appeasing the communists but he did it anyways and he knew these sorts of things were risking his life he would tell it to people around him he would joke about it how the cia is going to kill him any day now and and sure enough that's exactly what ended up happening when you read malcolm x's autobiography uh, written by Alex Haley, uh, Malcolm X said in there that I think one day I'll be killed by violence. Uh, so these people, Kennedy and uh, uh, Malcolm X and, and Gandhi as well, they, they knew that they would probably be killed by violence. It was like a premonition. And, and even still, John Kennedy still negotiated with our enemies, our enemies in Cuba and in the Soviet Union, even though he did bad things. So that's the profound, uh, that's one of the profound lessons of this story, the, like the lessons in the Quran that transcend time and space, that Kennedy, the top imperialist, the top cold warrior, 
of the world, the president of the United States, if he can turn and if he can sacrifice his life in the process of doing that, then what excuse do all the rest of us have? We're not even heads of state. We don't have CIAs and Joint Chiefs of Staff around us telling us that we have to nuclear bomb Cuba. If we don't do that, we'll be weak on communism. They'll bomb us. And the, the, the fact that Kennedy could resist what was actually that intense pressure, resisted at one point, not always resisted. Sometimes, a lot of times he went along with it. But the fact that he did resist it and he sacrificed his life for it, that's one of the deep profound lessons in this story that we could take away from. Okay, we have a gentleman here. Um, I, I forgot your name, Steve. Steve, who has a question from from the audience. Uh, come, come close, Steve. And uh, yeah, I will spotlight you. Go ahead. No, uh, I just have a question about whether you have any insights as to how the Golden Rule relates to liberation theology. Uh, you know, these uh, liberation theology, uh, I guess I can deduce what it means from the words, but I'm actually, I'm very new into like left-wing circles and activist circles. So these aren't really things I've read about. Uh, so I can't really comment on like liberation theology. I haven't read about this. I've read the Quran and uh, fund of, in regards to the golden rule, I think uh, that's fundamentally what it comes down to. I think that's like uh, one of the secrets of life. So that's, it's, it's a theme of Islam. It's a theme of all of these uh, traditions and tr uh, spiritual uh, traditions and religions and cultures. Uh, it's universal. So uh, yes, thanks for bringing up the golden rule. I think that's like a fundamental truth of like reality and life. Thank you, Steve. Um, another gentleman, come on up. Tell us your name, first of all. Uh, yeah. My name is Najmul, yeah, Najmul Islam. Yeah, I live in Littleton, I was interested in your talk. So yeah, thanks for the nice talk. Um, and uh, you, you mentioned that we should be exposed to these other views regarding Russia, Ukraine war, right? Because in mainstream, we only see one type of narrative. So one other thing that I was curious about is like, what is like the viewpoints of Ukrainians, right? Because that's probably the most important like a viewpoint in this case, they are the one who are doing the war or who are in the middle of these two great powers. And yeah, I was wondering if you have like insight regarding this, because like uh, according to polls, it seems like they still have a lot of support for European unions, although, um, although it increased after the war, which probably you can kind of make sense because due to war, maybe the support may increase. Uh, but like in US media, like how their opinions changed or maybe they got maybe manipulated by one side or the other, those things, uh, they don't can, uh, get mentioned that much. So I was just wondering if you have view regarding those insights. Yeah, th thank you so much. And th thanks for coming to the church. I'm sorry I wasn't, I'm not there. Uh, so, uh, you know, you, Ukraine, I, I come into this as someone who knew nothing of Russia and Ukraine, okay, like a few months ago, I knew nothing. All I knew was what we were told through our media and uh, through our fr friends and family or through our communities. And uh, the, the, the message I got from that was uh, that the Ukrainians are being oppressed by the imperial Russians. Russia is doing imperialism. They want to take over Ukraine and then Europe and then the world, probably the world. And Putin is Hitler. Okay, so that, that was my starting point, okay? And that's the starting point for a lot of us. And uh, it took me to read Stephen Cohen's book, War with Russia, who is an actual Russia expert. And that, that's when I learned, okay, actually, this is a little bit more complicated than that. This is a little bit more complicated. For example, just as one example, when the US did a coup in 2014 in Ukraine, and then the coup government came in and they outlawed the Russian language. And why is that significant? Because I didn't even know before reading this book that there was actually Ukraine, uh, Russia, th these places have a very complex history. And for example, in Ukraine, there's some very significant portion of the population, maybe 30% 
who speak Russian. They're ethnic Russians. They live in the eastern regions of Ukraine, or maybe what's now Russia. And uh, the, when the U.S. did a coup in Ukraine and the coup government came in, they outlawed the Russian language. And, and these neo-Nazis, uh, they, they burned alive ethnic Russians in the trade union hall in Odessa of tons of massacres. And, and the, the people in the Donbass region started fighting back and there's some type of civil war going on. And I'm like, wow, I knew nothing about this. CNN and Washington Post, New York Times, they made no mention of this where, where I was reading, but, but this actually seems significant. This actually seems relevant to what's happening. So all I'm saying is as American people, as US people, we're actually not qualified to talk about this. We don't know anything about any of this stuff. And all I'm saying is that our government should not be sending weapons to Ukraine from our tax money to fight Russia, okay? What Ukraine and Russia do, uh, they have a complex history that I don't even fully know about. And there's a lot to unpack there. And we're not the ones qualified to unpack it or to be uh, arbitrators in negotiation. But what we're doing is we're, we're being belligerent. We're, we're belligerent on this side. We're funding Ukraine with our tax money while our own country crumbles, while we live in a declining US empire where life expectancy is going down and drug addiction is going up and we're suffering, we're traumatized, but we, we take all our hard earned treasure and give it to Ukraine. Uh, not only is that impractical financially, it's, it's morally wrong. So that's all I'm saying. What, what do the people of Ukraine think or the people of Russia or the people in the Donbass or Crimea or in Poland and Hungary, I'll leave that to them. They can think whatever they want, okay? But what I think is the US should not be escalating this war, pouring fuel on the fire. The US shouldn't be causing this war by doing coups in Ukraine, by putting missiles on uh, Russia's border, by expanding NATO, et cetera, et cetera. So my, 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 my focus is on what our, our government is doing, the government in the country where I pay taxes, where I sometimes vote, or I might've voted in the past, uh, but, but, but in that country, the country where I live, where I have friends and family. Thank you. And thank you for coming such a long way to, to join us here. Um, and um, let's see, uh, we are- my, my hand thing doesn't whoa, work. Whoa, whoa. Is that Mary Lynn? Yeah, I'm sorry, my hand thing doesn't work on, on this um, Chromebook. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to get in line. Mary Lynn, you have the floor. Oh, okay, it's very quick. I just wanted to thank Omar and um, I agree with- Omar. Amar, I'm sorry. Um, I did. I did actually write down Amar. I don't have his last name though. It's Ahmad. M A M A H D. A M A H D. Okay. Um, it's A H M A D. A H M A D. Amar, this is Mary Lynn, longtime participant at Community Church. Yeah. Okay. Ahead, so Mary Lynn. I, I can send an email to the church care of him, right? Yeah, yes. Mary, you can take down my email address too. Thanks for coming. My email address is Amar, A M A R at A M A R. Yeah, A M A R at masspeaceaction.org. At masspeaceaction.org. Okay, I just wanted to say that I, I agree with everything you've said, like 99%, and I'm so glad that you said it. The one exception I have, I would suggest that you read more than one book about Gandhi. And what I suggest that you take a look at, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Arundhati Roy, but she wrote a book called The Doctor, The Saint, Caste, Race, and the Annihilation of Caste. And that's very important reading that very few people know about. The other is um, a more popular, e easier to read book. It's called Indian Summer. The Secret History of the End of Empire by Tusselman, T-U-N-Z-E-L-M-A-N. -E and um, I, I think there's just a lot of mysticism in the United States around Gandhi and what the actual circumstances were. He was, um, from my reading, um, very imperialistic, very racist, very misogynistic. Um, and very caste class bound. 
he did not want to see any disruption of that with India, and he was, I think he stood in the way of a, of a united India. But anyway, I would suggest these are very, Arundhati Roy comes with shining credentials from the, the left in activism, um, and definitely take a look at her, and um, the, the Tusselman is, a, is the popular book, but um, uh, just to get a different perspective. Thanks, Mary and Dean. I know we're at one, so just, I'll respond to that really quickly. Th thank you so much, Mary. Uh, and uh, with Gandhi, you're right. I've only read uh, this one book about Gandhi uh, by James Douglas, and that's what I was referencing in my comments about Gandhi today. Uh, but but yes, I've heard. I've what what you're saying about Gandhi. I've heard that, and I've heard I've heard Indian people say uh, he was very uh, like cat. There's a lot of mysticism around Gandhi, and he was very. Uh, biased in terms of caste and that sort of thing. So, so I have heard that, but even though I'm from a South Asian background, I'm, I, I haven't read enough about this. Like I, I actually don't know enough about this to really comment on that. So thank you for those suggestions with those books. Well, we're getting on the, the bewitching hour, which is when uh, those of us who are here get to go enjoy a lunch that Luis Guzman has prepared for us. Uh, today, it happens to be pupusas, which are the Salvadoran delicacy that we um, enjoy very frequently here at Community Church. And um, uh, it just by way of inviting you on future Sundays to be here present with us, uh, in, and, um, and it's starting to happen uh, slowly. People are slouching out of their, their uh, caves and, and coming to, to join us here physically. But you can always just uh, turn on the Zoom and be with us uh, virtually because we will continue to do that. Thank you, Michael Jackson, for joining us today. And thank you, Amar Ahmad. I wanna just one last time spotlight Michael Jackson and one last time spotlight, uh, oh, he, I lost him, where did he go? Amar, where are you? It's It's probably my own uh my own uh oh there he there, 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 there he was there he was. okay one more one more look at, at this beautiful face okay okay and and that's how we say the meeting is over ours is a simple faith life is a short embrace heaven is in this place every day um, hope is the ground we till, make each day what you will, thankful for dreams fulfilled every day. And on that note, we say goodbye to everybody and um, do good work and keep in touch and come see us and see this beautiful uh, display of paintings at Community Church on a Monday or Wednesday or Friday, preferably on a Wednesday, which is at noon, our sort of open house day um, to receive people and have, have lunch together and talk a lot of stuff. And we've had some wonderful visitors recently and we will have some more in the future, maybe you or maybe not. Thank you everybody. Take good care. We'll see you next Sunday to hear T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland read in its entirety by the Poets Theater and more, uh, more on its way down the pike. If you have any suggestions for speakers or ideas for things we should talk about, be in touch. Uh, comchurch at gmail.com is the easiest email address to reach us.